Okay. Uh, today is the time to have this meeting, isn't it? You know, on Iran, what's happening in Israel, what's like imperialism. And uh, there's so many people who are part of the uh, Palestine movement who are understanding the situation, what's going on and going on, and it's got something to do with imperialism. It's an imperialist war. It's an imperialist assault. And that, that's, a, that's a good uh, place uh, for so many people to start. Uh, and I think that the understanding of imperialism is one of, is a big, well-armed, mighty power, the Americans, you know, the American government, the military, and they're the imperialist uh, power that is causing all the uh, bad things to happen uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, I want to talk about uh, inter-imperialist rivalry and bring, if you like, if you like, I want to bring a clear understanding of what is imperialism and the history of imperialism and how we got to where we are today. In fact, I want to talk about three things in this meeting to start the discussion that we're all going to have, and that is, I want to talk about the inter-imperialist conflict, <coughs> but also, why is it that America hates Iran and Israel also hates Iran. But why? And thirdly, I want to talk about the response to imperialism and the, what's going on in Palestine, which is really about the whole arc of resistance that there is uh, and all the different types of resistance going on uh, for support for the Palestinians. So, on the history of inter imperialist rivalry, you see, because you can look at the world today, and America is the imperialist country. But let's go back to the World War, or rather, before there was a World War, uh, 1914. This is a time when uh, Marxist uh, revolutionaries, particularly Karin and then later Lenin, developed a political theory of, what, of imperialism. And essentially, they uh, showed and argued that the economic competition that there is between different uh, companies and then also the economic competition between different countries, that economic competition develops into military competition uh, to compete, you know, bomb for bomb, tank for tank, missile for missile. And I'll, I'll flesh that out a bit. But at the time of the First World War, there were a number of imperialist blocs. There was Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and then there was the rising power of Germany that wanted to develop uh, markets and have an empire, and then there was the British Empire. And there was a war that was fought, First World War, and the outcome of that war was a division and a, re a, a division of the world amongst the victorious, if you like, powers. After the end of the uh, First World War, in 1917, you then get the British government uh, shaping what was left of the uh, Ottoman Empire and they went, Palestine, we'll have that bit. Especially because there is a uh, Suez Canal right next to it. So the outcome of the carbon at the end of the World War, there was carbon all over Africa, all over <laughs> Asia, and everywhere, but in the Middle East, France got the Lebanon and Britain got Palestine and the mandate Palestine was set up. And Palestine was set up by uh, the, the, the British and they said it was going to be uh, a little Jewish also in their city of hostile Arabism. Now, the conflict in the First World War didn't end, it was another war that it led to, the Second World War, and then you had the different political uh, empires fighting uh, in the Second World War, principally the uh, German Nazi led. Axis powers with the Italians and then the Austrians and, 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 and others that they conquered other countries. There was the British Empire, there was the Russian uh, Empire, then headed by Stalin, which was the USSR, uh, then, uh, and uh, you had the rise of new power, the Americans. And the outcome of the Second World War was a further redivision of the globe. They literally carved it up with lines on the map between. The, the winning powers uh, at, at the altar. Uh, the 
post-Second World War period was another period of inter-imperialist rivalry. But, but then it was two big blocks. On the one side there was Russia, rather Russian-led United Soviet Socialist Republic, the USSR, which was Russia and Poland, Hungary, Lithuania and all those uh, other countries. And on the other side was uh, America, the, you know, the eagle, competing with the bear. And America that came out of the Second World War was the absolute best uh, arms, most funds, and the strongest power. And this, what was called the Cold War, was the British rivalry between the two went on a long while, but by 1989, uh, there was, uh, uh, if you like, the Russian bloc was found that it hadn't been able to compete economically and militarily, competing with America, and its economy was exhausted. But further than that, the people in East European countries started to have uprisings. You had the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then uh, the, what was called the East European Revolutions. And then we enter, I think, another period uh, which starts at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and this is a particular period that I think we would describe as the beginning of a period, but there's a new imperialism. Because after the fall of the America stepped forward onto the world stage and said publicly, their political leaders said, there's one superpower in the world, it's us, America, no one in the world can mess with us, we can reshape the world to, to further American interests. There was a project that they had, a project for New American Century, that's how they saw it, 100 years of American domination of the entire world. They even had a list of the countries that they were going to have regime change in. And then, was it Bolton who made a list that was really going to take and they had change in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. Now these plans were plans and dreams, but they were absolutely destroyed by the resistance of the people in Afghanistan and the people in Iraq. And after 20 odd years, America lost in Iraq, and then later lost in Afghanistan and had to withdraw. And uh, <coughs> It, it, it really punctured the, uh, if you like, this belief that America had in itself that they were so strong militarily that they could do what they wanted. They found out that there were uh, political and military forces that, that defeated them. Now, what happened at the end of the war between America and Iraq, Saddam so Hussein's Iraq? And there was a good joke to explain what happened. In the war between America and Iraq, who won? Iran. <laughs> and I say that because the Iran, right next to it, uh, in Iraq, were uh, instrumental in uh, supporting the, the, the uh, fight back of the, of the army and the the remnants of the army in, in, in of the Afghan United resistance, sorry, the, the Iraqi resistance, uh, and the uh, outcome was that after the uh, defeat of Saddam Hussein, Iran was strengthened. Now, the oil that America wanted to control in, uh, in Iraq, they wanted the oil, and the whole plan was that oil was going to go westwards. Would be under the control and direction of the American government. Where does the oil go today? It doesn't go westward, it goes eastwards. It goes to China. You know? Uh, so Iran has this pipeline now feeding uh, oil to China. So the end of this uh, period of Cold War, the belief that there was only one superpower in the world. America, that has been uh, tested and shattered with these massive defeats in Afghanistan and then also uh, in, in Iraq. And they didn't get to shape uh, and control what was going on in Syria. So that's a bit of a history of inter-imperialist rivalry. But what about today? Where are we at today? And I think the best indication of, if you like, 
the balance of military and political forces in the world between the imperialist countries that are fighting together against each other is to look at what's going on uh, in the American Senate at the moment where they're poised to pass uh, what's going to be one, maybe three bills, to give billions of dollars. Who to? They're going to give billions of dollars to Ukraine. They've lost the war in Ukraine. They haven't said it, it's going to go on for a while. There was no, uh, there's not going to be success uh, from the Western side. And they're going to give a load of money, basically. You know, they don't want pensioners to starve to death, and they haven't got any uh, shells left. Uh, not that there's any left to buy, because most of them are being sent from the West in part to, uh, to, to Israel. Uh, and so they've given, they've got money for the, uh, uh, for what's going on here, to support Ukraine. The other lot of money, billions of dollars, is to give to Israel to carry on with their get more fighter jets, X 16s but also to repair and upgrade the dome and defence and to give more missiles, which they're running out of. But the third bit of money, a lot of money, is to go to Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan right next to China. Uh, Taiwan that America would want to uh, keep away from China. You know, China has aspirations historically, and if you look at the map, it's part of China, not part of America. So what, what we're talking about here is America's imperialist interests and their imperialist competition is against is about what's going on in, 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 in the border of Russia and Ukraine, and what's going on in the Middle East, and what's going on in the South China Sea. This is the uh, interimperialist rivalry going on uh, at the moment, and I think we need to understand that to, to get to, if you like, a character about well, what is going on with Iran and uh, why, the, uh, why the attack and the counterattack. You know, it can be very confusing. If you've got the historical understanding, it does, I think, provide a lot more clarity. Interimperialist rivalry. There's not one imperialism. There are many imperialisms competing against each other. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is why is it that America hates Iran? And I think the root of that, going back to the 1970s, we had a war, we had a world where there was America on one side, the Russian bloc, USSR on the other, there was a Cold War, they didn't fight each other. There were wars in other parts of the world. Principally in a country that America thought was just a tiny little country, we've got hardly any people in it, we've got any, you know, weapon or whatever, Vietnam. And America fought the war in Vietnam. In 1968, there was a, a, a fight back by the Vietnamese people who launched a military attack on the American base, uh, and that was famously called the Tet Offensive, which was 1968 on New Year's Day or something like that. But by the early 1970s, the mid 1970s, America had lost the war in Vietnam. Three reasons, the resistance of the Vietnamese people, the mass anti-war movement across America, but also across the world. I mean, it was really, really big. In America, remember they had conscription and students, young people were being told you've got to go and fight in Vietnam and they rebelled. Uh, and then the third part of what led to the complete defeat of the American army in Vietnam was mutiny in the American army itself. The troops were like, we're not going to fight anymore. And America suffered a, a, a massive a defeat in, in uh, Vietnam. If they had a defeat in Vietnam in 1979, they had a humiliation because Iran used to be on an axis, they called it the Tehran Tel Aviv axis. The American power in the whole region, the Middle East region, was ruled by the Americans who had a big base in uh, Tel Aviv, in Israel, an even bigger base in Iran because the Shah of Iran was pro Western. The oil went favorably to the Western oil companies. But in 1979, there was an uprising in Iran led by workers. Uh, it was a revolutionary uprising. Uh, that went into a different way of Iran being run, where the resources of Iran was for the Iranian mm -hmm. people and not plundered by the billionaire Shah of Iran and, uh, and then went back to America. So there was uh, a revolutionary movement in Iran, 
the Americans were absolutely kicked out and humiliated, and a new regime, they would call it the West the regime, a government in Iran was set up, and it was uh, set up, and it was because it was born out of Iran, out of uh, revolution, in a period where they were very anti American, uh, anti Americanism in, in, in Iran. Uh, the Iranian state, the first thing that it did was lend support to the fight in South Africa. They gave arms and helped train to the army of the ANC in Qatar in Sizwi. They also gave arms and military support to the PLO, which was then under Arafat fighting actually against Israel, unlike the PLO today, that did a deal in Oslo and and the rounding up the Palestinians who were fighting back. But Iran was the particular way in which it, it came into it being, has supported, if you like, uh, resistance countries, or countries that would resist and oppose uh, American hegemony. Now, there's more reasons why America doesn't like uh, Iran. More recently, when there was the Arab Spring, and then there was uh, an uprising, a uh, revolutionary movement in, in uh, Syria, Iran su supported the leader of Syria, Assad, a vicious butcher, in crushing the revolutionary movement, and particularly to, to defend and make sure that there was a Russian base of the Mediterranean in Syria, which, which there is. Uh, more, again, more recently, even more recently, there is an economic uh, alliance of countries called the BRICS. Uh, it's Brazil, Russia, India, sometimes I'll get, forget which countries are in it. But two new countries have joined. Uh, one of them is Iran, and the other is China. So you have an economic uh, setup that is starting to compete with the hegemony of the US dollar uh, internationally. And finally, uh, Iran does not control the uh, other countries who are fighting back in the region of the Arc of Resistance. But it does have uh, links and influence and finance and support. So you have Iran, but you also have the uh, Houthi, the Yemeni uh, resistance, you have the resistance. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and you have Iraqi resistance organizations that say, why is there an American base still in our country when we want them out? So there's, a, there's an arc of resistance uh, that feeds uh, and, and into, uh, into one another. Now, what happened? Uh, so, so that's a whole list of reasons why America hates Iran. I've talked about inter-imperious rivalry, it's always gone on and continues today. A specific, concrete, what about Iran? What sort of country is it? How did it come about? What are, it, what are its interests? What is it trying to do? But the last thing I want to talk about is uh, what I call, uh, I think it, what is called the other superpower. Because at the time of the uh, uh, opposition to uh, what was going on in uh, the war on Iraq, there was a massive protest movement in this country, shaped and led by the Stop the War Coalition, we were leading part of that, and there was what was the biggest demonstration in the history of the world, February the 15th, 2003. A million people on the streets, actually now people said it was two million, I think two million people wanted to be on the streets, but it was, it was absolutely massive. And the New York Times ran an editorial quite soon afterwards, it said, it was headline, the other superpower. Mm -hmm. And it was saying that there is the superpower of America, but there's opposition to everything they've done, especially in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere in their history. And there's opposition to that. And that was shown most, obviously, on the big demonstration in February. Uh, but it was uh, an opposition that was described not as an anti war movement. I think the New York Times talks about uh, public opinion, you know. Uh, and, and the strength of public opinion, a really anti war sentiment. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, I didn't want to just say as an aside, because people forget this. On February 15, 2003, a million people marched on the streets. And what was the demand? There were two demands. Don't attack Iraq, freedom of Palestine. The anti-war movement was for Palestine from its very, uh, very, if you like, for its inception, its very uh, first, uh, first uh, if you like, main outcome. Out in. And that is, is the, the basis on which this big second, if you like, the anti-war movement today, the pro-Palestinian movement, uh, follows on from that. Now, uh, I see David Cameron's all over the news at the moment, he's now British Foreign Secretary, telling everyone that it's a success if your country bombs on missiles, uh, and Israel should, you know, they've done well. And, you know, I remember this David Cameron because there was uh, America, as I said, Afghanistan, Iraq, but they also sent bombing raids into Syria, and they bombed Syria. And so in Britain, Cameron, who was Prime Minister of the uh, United Kingdom, uh, said that we're going to join and we're going to bomb Syria. But unlike what happened with Iraq, when there was no vote in Parliament, in the British Parliament, about you know, joining this war, to make sure that doesn't happen again because that wasn't right. So they had a vote in Parliament, and Cameron went to the British Parliament and he said, The generals tell me British uh, interests are in danger, but our country is in danger, and I'm asking for the authorization for Britain to uh, take military action and bomb Syria. It was a big debate, and then a vote, and he lost the vote. It's the first time ever that the British Prime Minister has asked for an endorsement of a war and the Parliament said no. Why did they do it? Especially it's the Tory government. The, the Tory, as you voted, they said, uh, the tide of public opinion has turned. Uh, the, the well uh, of uh, sentiment and belief in the government has been poisoned you know, by all the lies that they told to justify the war uh, against Iraq and the, the million people that were killed. So they lost the vote. I think that's why they didn't actually have a vote, did they, about the ceasefire? You know, in the Parliament recently, they did us some scuffle so that it wasn't a vote. Because they don't want to lose a vote like that again. And although Britain's been involved in this attack just recently on Iraq, on Iran, there was no authorization from Parliament. I don't think Stalin, I know that Stalin wouldn't have opposed it, but they, they, they don't want that, they don't want that sort of even uh, pretense of democratic discussion about it. So, uh, what I want to do is just conclude then, really, because it's been six months of uh, the Israeli uh, defense force, the Israeli occupying force, uh, attacking the, uh, the uh, you know, Gaza and killing so many people with the with, with everything. Now, I don't need to go through what ha what's happened in the last six months because you, me, and everyone else, we've lived it, you know. But what we can say is, six months on, what's the balance of what, what's happened? Israel have lost. It's not Mark Crank saying that. That's an editor in Haaretz, a serious newspaper in uh, Israel last week. We have lost the war in Gaza. We've got to face up to this. They didn't uh, defeat, degrade, and destroy the mass. They've not got hostages. Uh, and also now are seen, and I think forever will be seen, as a country that is a general that, that organized and we're enthusiastic about committing genocide. There's an old saying, you know, old stains cast long shadows. The stain of what they've done, and we see it every day, every day before you know you get up, you see it every night, you see it again, and it's gone on every day for six months. And what they've done, that's not gonna they're not gonna get over that, you know, in, in if you like in the in the, in the in in the future. So I just want to end with this. We've had six months of killing the Palestinians. We've had six months of absolute solidarity with the Palestinian struggle, not just in Britain, which is actually the highest level of, of, of support, but also in America and, and across the world. But if you compare what happened with the anti-war movement to say stop the war in, in Iraq, and you can look at where are we with the Palestinian movement today, 
the time of the Iraq war, a third of people in the opinion poll said we shouldn't have a war with Iraq. Today, two thirds of people around that in Britain say not only should there be any siege to Gaza, they don't think we should, Britain should be arming Israel. So it's a much bigger, more sustained uh, movement, and it's involved more people. And, and, and in fact, you know, there's so much uh, pro Palestine sentiment going on. It is quite uh, phenomenal and difficult to keep up with. So, just to finally say this, I'm from the generation that was involved in the anti-war movement. But now, there's a generation Palestine, <laughs> an entire generation who their lives are defined and will be defined by what we've done in support of Palestinian people in the post in opposition to American uh, you know, domination of the area and American imperialism. So we've had, over the six months, and, and, and they're still relevant, these demands, end the siege of Gaza. Uh, then we've had ceasefire now, which is one, and there's a new demand to be added to the movement uh, for justice for the Palestinians and freedom for Palestine, and that is no war on Iran. Iran, the war on Iran, is a continuation of the war on the Palestinians.